Good evening. My name's Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the season opening performance of our 23rd year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. <laughs> Thank you. For those of you new to the Arts Cafe, our mission is to present the nation's most celebrated poets and writers along with New England's finest musicians in programs that lift your spirits while deepening your minds. Mm. If we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. So, were you one of the millions or, or perhaps billions of people who watched the Rio Olympics on television? Mm. Mm. Anybody out there miss them? Sorry, only a curmudgeon could have failed to be stirred by the extraordinary human feats of Usain Bolt, Katie Ledecky, Mark Phelps, oh, those girl gymnasts. Nonetheless, amid those two weeks of remarkable athleticism, nationalism, and of course, commercialism, I was reminded that, that the original Olympiad was a religious festival that included competitions in athletics, theater, and poetry. That's right. The greatest playwrights and actors in the Greek world would compete for laurels and prizes, as would the greatest poets. There were even large poetry venues whose crowds would pay real money to hear lyric poets recite their art. Conceptually, not unlike the Arts Cafe. Yes, I know what you're thinking. Perhaps we ought to incorporate a few somersaults and foot races into our programs. <clears throat> but consider, in a museum in Athens, is a tall-stemmed cup of ancient Greek origin that is inscribed with a line from the great poet Sappho. No, there is no evidence that she competed in the Olympics. But the inscription on that cup reads, mere air these words, but delicious to hear. That snatch of verse is wonderful, isn't it, in so many ways, but in particular for how it defines the experience of poetry on both the spoken and listening level. You see, writing a poem, of course, suspends the ephemera of sound, transmuting sound to the printed page, and thereby holding it against death in some notable cases rendering it immortal. But it is in being read aloud to an attentive listener that a poem truly lives, mere air, but delicious to hear. And this, my friends, is why the Arts Cafe Mystic exists, with or without somersaults. Our opening voice tonight is the writer and poet David Leff. Before devoting himself to writing, Mr. Leff was a deputy commissioner of the Connecticut State Department of Environmental Protection. And in his hometown of Collinsville was a volunteer firefighter for 26 years and is now chair of the town's historic district. These biographical notes to some extent inform his writing which speaks to a deep sense of place and celebration of New England's natural landscape. Mr. Leff is the author of three highly regarded books of nonfiction, all of which are travel books of a special sort. They include Deep Travel, Hidden in Plain Sight, and The Last Undiscovered Place which I might add was a Connecticut Book Award finalist. All of these books are notable for their delightfully quirky, whimsical, and altogether original way of looking at nature and small town life in New England. He's also, though, 
published three fine books of poems, including Tinker's Dam, which has been described as an extraordinary journey to the deeper places of the heart. These are strongly crafted poems whose meditations report on the deep encounters in life that either break our hearts or make us fall in love with life all over again. But won't you please see for yourself as you join me in welcoming David Leff. Uh, I do know that I was, part of my job here was to lift your spirits. I have a bad back, so I don't know how much lifting I'm going to do. Uh, Emerson said that, and can everyone hear me? Okay, okay. Emerson said that there is a crack in everything God has made. And uh, Leonard Cohn, the uh, poet and songwriter, said that crack is how the light gets in. And I'm rather fond of things that are not quite right, have a little damage. I think they have an extraordinary beauty, and hence uh, this poem, Heart's Desire. I crave damaged things. I seek what's splotched, dimpled, splintered, peculiar, and worn. Old glass panes with prismatic sparkles admit me to a delightfully wavy, distorted world. Comfort beckons from a chair, scratched and nicked with a family's hard use, or boots scuffed and creased to a foot shape. Scarred cheeks, chipped cups, tailless squirrels, charred beams, swayback barns, and dented cars brim with stories. Liberty rings loudest from a silent, fractured bell, and Mona Lisa's reticent smile outshines any toothpaste commercial grin. We're yet we're seduced by Hollywood perfection, the enticing magic of digital images, and the angelic sounds of pitch correction software. We forget that a broken heart's boundless, thrumming ache makes us feel most alive. Now, I, I write a lot of uh, nature poetry. And uh, I've given seminars in nature poetry writing at the Sunken Garden Festival and elsewhere. And uh, I always tell folks that nature poetry isn't necessarily about how beautiful the sky is, about bird song, about grand old trees. It's really about our relationship with nature. And sometimes that relationship is a little rocky. Um, and this poem is about the Housatonic River, uh, which, as you know, uh, General Electric um, contaminated with PCBs. Um, let them enjoy their place up in Boston, if they will. They left Pittsfield, Massachusetts, an absolute wreck. Uh, so this is called the Housatonic at West Cornwall, where that red covered bridge is. Some of you may have been there. And it starts with an epigraph uh, from Oliver Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., the physician and poet, not his son, the jurist, who said, there's no tonic like the Hoosa. And indeed, there isn't. Shadowed by green humped hills, anglers cast into riffles and pocket water where trout linger among rocks, rising for flies with concentric ripple kisses. Carefully, they wade over cobbles as swallow acrobats dart and swoop for insects. Absorbed in the swash and roll of the river as it seeds beneath the barn red covered bridge, they briefly awaken to the rhythmic rumble of tires to drive. Occasionally, they pull magic from the water like a dream hauled from the depths of sleep, glistening silver, rainbowed or stippled in lucent pink, orange and yellow. But every shining, defiant beauty is returned before drowning in air as PCBs secretly poison sediments where the miracle electric age chemical bringing good things to life lies layered like fossils, marking a time when fish were turned to forbidden fruit contaminated by knowledge. Thank you. Uh, I live in the old mill village of Collinsville, once the edge tool manufacturing capital of the world. Like so many New England villages, they were known for some product. 
And uh, as in many such villages, the cemetery rises very high over the, the village. And from there, you can see the valley of the Farmington River where the factory drew its power at one point. And I like going there at night when the stars are out and they, they seem like hopeful boat up in the sky. And the lights below tell a somewhat different story, constellation. In nights moonless deep, I climb cemetery hills, steep terraces, my body fading into darkness, a slender shadow among the shadows, insubstantial as the shades beneath the inscribed stone. Pumping legs strain against the slope as I fall further into my breath, just the heaving chest feeding hungry lungs. I'm dizzy on the crest, eyes buzzing with sparkling pinpricks of light, a chaotic world connected by shepherds who long ago tattooed the sky with images and stories. Overhead, Orion hunts beside his dog Canis, and Hercules forever faces snaky Hydra who spawned two heads for each severed. A winged horse gallops across galaxies, a ram's gold fleece glows, and a scorpion, crab, and dragon terrorize the dark. Twinkling in the valley below, is a firmament of incandescent sodium vapor and chalky fluorescence spilling from street lamps. These constellations gossip about women hiding bruises, couples holding hands at dinner, babies conceived in backseat trysts, buddies gathered for a beer and boasts behind pretzeled neon, and children who lug textbooks and learning disabilities to school while dreaming of Fenway's outfit. Staring into two worlds, blinking at each other, I make a wish and realize, at last, I've caught my breath. Now, you may remember uh, a few years ago, we had that um, October storm. The leaves were still out, and the, um, uh, the snow came down, very wet snow, and broke all those trees. The electricity was out for a long time. Um, I'm fortunate in that I live in a house built in 1847 when fireplaces actually threw heat, but it was still very cold in my house. So I, I went to the library to get warm. That was the emergency shelter for the town. And uh, as I'm walking by the desk, one of the librarians said, hey, hey David, um, that book came in. And it was um, Merrill's Fading Light at Sandover. And uh, of course, James Merrill lived not very far away from here. Um, I wrote about his uh, apartment in my book, Hidden in Plain Sight. And um, so here I was by firelight that evening reading about his experiments with the, Ouija, with the Ouija board, uh, he and David Jackson. So this is called Halloween at Sandor. Three days without electricity and it's spooky dark, ideal for goblins and phantasms needing no costumes to leap from imagination. No children with their trick-or-treat laughter warding off the spectral and the weird. At the window, I feel the creepy lack of skeletons, hobos, soldiers, and Marvel comic monsters with pillowcases, paper bags, and plastic pumpkins held open. Over a foot of mashed potato snow ignited a firecracker snap and crack of trees weighted with summer's leaves and winter's storm, leaving wires down and tangled, roads blocked, the woods a freak show of fractured and contorted shapes of mangled branches dangling. Faded now to starlit silhouettes, I feel hurt radiating from the splintered bones of August's shade and autumn's color. In a house too cold with a fridge too warm, I burrowed into my sleeping bag beside the mouth of the fireplace where I've slept fitfully every hour or so, stoking coals with my breath and tossing chunks of wood on the fire. At dinner, a, a dinner of water, cheese, bread, and canned peaches, leave me tempted by pounds of chocolate, Kit Kats, Hershey bars, Snickers, and baby roots, whose presence seems an absence. This morning, I found warmth and light in the library among impromptu business meetings, old men chatting softly over rustling newspapers, and children glaze-eyed by videos. Passing the reference desk, I'm handed a forgotten book ordered weeks ago, Merrill's Epic Sandover, a journal of conjuring via Ouija board. What fortune beckoned me on this benighted, hallowed eve 
to encounter such poetic occult. Now, camped by my hearth, updrafted smoke like incense, I read a dog-eared paperback in flickering light as cold, dark, and quiet circle like spirits. Rhythmic words echo water dripping from the tap slightly caught against freezing pipes. My walls are sunburned with flames reflections, rhyming the coral-colored room where Merrill was summoned to encounters with others. Fire becomes a home of multiple voices, boiling, puffing, and up the chimney breath, the sizzle spit, pop, and crackle. Words and blaze work their hypnosis. No Peter Pan flight, but a journey far and deep to the confluence of fear, beauty, and disbelief. I'm locked in the book's embrace, thirsting for something palpable, until at last my body becomes the board on which the planchette of my imagination fires. So, on with our show. For tonight's musical interlude, we're delighted to welcome back the wonderful folk singer-songwriter, Lara Herskovich. We're fortunate to catch Ms. Herskovich with a superb new album called Misfits, which like her previous albums, balances passionate singing, socially engaged messages, and sheer lyrical musicality. There are some artists for whom the journey by which they come to their calling is both interesting and useful information. Lara Herskovich is one such. After enduring the usual enforced piano lessons and composing the obligatory adolescent love songs, she had the good sense to get into law school and the even better sense to decide against attending. Instead, she ventured into volunteer social work, then the real thing, doing a graduate degree in macro policy and planning, which led to a career with Save the Children doing community development. This included posts in Africa, Asia, and Central America. While abroad, she picked up that most portable songwriting instrument, the guitar. And it was then that she began to compose songs of a sort that would stick. And then she began to conceive of music as a career. Several pages later in the story, Laura has issued six acclaimed albums, has toured from Miami to Maine, and appeared prominently on NPR's Prairie Home Companion and Where We Live. She's also been Connecticut State Troubadour and done gigs at CBGB's and Bitter End in New York, even while continuing to do policy social work as an advocate for social justice. So won't you please join me in welcoming Laura Herskovich. The line on the chorus, the first line of every chorus on this song was taken from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We have come too far to turn back now. We've been laying low, letting the foxes pretend. They will take excellent care of all the hands. Some things we need to hear are hard to say say them anyway we are all we've got we shape this world every day if we intend to or not we all stand on shoulders Someone showed us the sky. We move forward, teaching each other to fly. We've come too far to turn back now. Seven generations entrust their perfect vow. 
The footprints teach us we can get through. Love is the bravest thing to do. Where the hand leaves the drum before it falls. Before this pile of boulders becomes a wall. Where the snowflake meets the air, there's possibility everywhere. Oh, meet me there. We've come too far to turn back now seven generations and trust their perfect vow the footprints teach us we can get through love is the bravest thing to do so meet me where the doing meets the undone and grab a hold of any hand that has begun oh, we've come too far to turn back now seven generations and trust their sacred vow the footprint Teach us, we will get through. Love is the bravest thing. Love is the bravest thing. Love is the thing to do. So, on with the show. Stephen Dobbins, who is our featured poet tonight, is surely one of the nation's most versatile and accomplished writers. Having published 40 books of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Think about that, 40 books. All of them remarkable for their high ambition and consistent excellence. Mr. Dobbins, you might be interested to know, began as a journalist working for the Detroit News but soon discovered that his great gift was in imaginative writing, and most especially poetry, which he characterizes as the most precise, complicated, and beautiful of any written form. If he had written nothing more than his 13 literary novels, he would be regarded as one of our best novelists. In fact, do yourself a favor of finding a copy of The Church of Dead Girls, a mighty book. Mr. Dobbin's serious novels have been translated into 15 languages and metamorphosed into three films. But as though to flaunt his narrative gift, Mr. Dobbins has also produced a series of 10 detective novels. The funny and fun Charlie Bradshaw series all set on the racetrack scene at Saratoga. Great reads. You'll find them in any library. In addition to his fiction, Mr. Dobbins has also written two widely praised books of essays on the craft of writing poems. Billy Collins has said that if you have these two books, the, your poetry instruction self your poetry instruction shelf is complete. Hmm. But it is the poems of Stephen Dobbins that concern us tonight. In addition to the embarrassment of riches constituted by his fiction and nonfiction, Mr. Dobbins has produced 14 books of poems whose brilliance and originality place him securely in the pantheon of the best poets of his generation, and I mean poets like Philip Levine, Sharon Old, C.K. Williams, and Donald Tall. Mr. Will Mr. Dobbins comes to us tonight with a just published new book of poems called The Day's Last Light Reddens the Leaves 
of the Copper Beach. Simply a superb book that affirms and builds on his reputation. It includes several specimens of comic poems and narrative poems that he's so well known for. Indeed, through the years, this poet has practically reinvented the narrative poem. But the day's last light also shows the poet in deeply reflective moments, considering the loss of friends, family, and loves, the losses that mount with old age. There are grace notes in these autumnal poems that are new to Dobbin's work. But the breakthrough moments in this lovely book surely come in the section titled 16 Sonnets for Isabel. Isabel, the poet's wife who died tragically a few years ago. The sonnets report on grief and heartbreak with a restraint, emotional depth, and metaphorical power that make of them high art. I'm afraid I could go on and on. You're probably thinking. So help me put a stop to this by joining with me in welcoming Stephen Dobbins. The day I learned my wife was dying, the knowledge became a leash clipped to my collar, a leash in the paw of her illness, which rose tall above me. And if I thought of a book, ball game, or chicken dinner, the leash would be given a sharp yank to show who was in charge and whack me with the fact of her dying. I wore the leash all day. I wore it at work, and when I slept, I wore it in the shower. A single step in the wrong direction put it in action, and I'd be flat on my back. You know those dodgy trade-offs in swap shops? It was like that. All my thoughts traded for the one I dreaded. Skin. The day I learned my wife was dying, I touched the hat, <clears throat> I touched the back of my hand gently to her cheek. How warm it felt. What will it be like when it's not? To find out, I took bags of green beans from the freezer, stuck my finger in ice cream <clears throat> to feel the cold, but I couldn't get the temperature right. But no, all that's a lie. How paralyzing becomes bad news. I felt I knew exactly what her skin would be like. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And whatever I guessed, it would be worse. And can I guess the color? There will be no color. <clears throat> Never. <clears throat> the day I learned my wife was dying, I went to read about volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, fire, bloody war, and murder. I wanted to discover the most awful because I knew her death would be worse than that. And even crueler would be her absence, not for a day or a year. It meant not coming back. That was what I couldn't imagine. How many days in never? How many times would we hear a car and think, that's her, or hear the phone ring and feel suddenly happy, only to grasp it was basically nobody? And each burst of knowing would be one little death, and they will happen all day. This is the last one I'm going to read of those. <clears throat> it's called Gardens. The day <clears throat> I learned my wife was dying, I thought of how knowledge is finite while imagination has no end. It's like the earth versus the universe. And once out there, why come home? But I have no choice. The imagination abruptly sags and plop, I'm here again, and everything's worse. This happens dozens of times each day. I expect those who are mad are stuck on imagination's side and can't get back. I've come to envy them, to flee the awful for what the mind constructs, impossible gardens with books and good things to eat, and she'll be there, healthy and laughing.
Oh, there's my little thing. This is called uh, Hero. Do I want to read Hero? No, I'll read something else. It's called <coughs> Mrs. Brewster's Second Grade Class Picture. That's me standing in the third row with a wiseacre grin, skinny and blonde, taller than the others. Of the rest, George and Jane, Jacqueline and Tom, a class of 16, and I recall nearly all the names. The boys in white shirts or plaid, the girls in skirts and bobby socks. Mrs. Brewster stands to the right, dark hair, a benign smile. She, who I thought looked old, looks about 40. Bailey School, East Lansing, Michigan. By now, roughly 60 years have passed, while the lives that, in 1948, were scarcely at the start of life, have almost completed their separate arcs, if they haven't done so already. Strange to think that some are dead. A few of these children had great success. A few had moderate triumphs. Others were dismal failures. Some were granted happiness each day they spent on Earth. Some felt regret with every step. I know nothing of how their lives turned out. Look at Margaret, sitting cross-legged in the front row in a light-colored dress. The black and white photograph can't do justice to her fine red hair. A smile still uncorrupted by appetite or cunning. No telling how long it retained its luster. But all, must have but all must have pursued life with various degrees of passion, arrived at decisions they felt the only ones possible to make. How many would now think otherwise, that the indispensable trip to Phoenix might as easily have been made to New York, that the choice of a career in law might just as well have been a job in the bank? What is needed, after all? Which choices are the ones really necessary? Could I have been happy as a doctor or even as a cop? No burning passion lies hidden in these faces. All that came later, if it came at all. But how bright and eager they appear. How ready to get started. One morning, Mrs. Brewster gave us a treat, showing her slides of Yellowstone Park. In the dim light of drawn shades, we stared at a buffalo calf crossing a brook a bald eagle perched on a dead branch, Firehole River, Mystic Falls, Old Faithful, of course. How strange these places looked compared to where we lived. Were these the wonders we'd been promised? At the water's edge, a grizzly devours the carcass of an elk. A black wolf creeps out of the pines. There are some of these poems. I did a number of poems where I tried to, I don't know, you get, sometimes you get bored, you decide, I have to do something entirely different. <clears throat> so these, I told students, you know, you can never put the effect before the cause. You know, so the reader's not gonna understand what you're talking about. So then I thought, well, that isn't necessarily true, so I wrote a bunch of poems that put the effect before the cause, just as, you know. <clears throat> I've always had a perverse streak. I don't know where it's come from. Probably New Jersey. In any case, these are, uh, work is one sentence, pretty much. And they start with the last event, and then they go back to the beginning, more or less. This is called narrative. A chunk of metal cubed and spat out by a car-crushing bailing press, a Ford, 20 years old, seemingly red, last driven by a teenage girl who had failed to check the oil, a gift from a doting grandmother with a terror of squashing squirrels recklessly crossing the road, who drove the car only to church after buying the Ford at Ziggy's, a used car lot when repossessed from a single mom who had missed her payments till Ziggy got cross, a woman working at Walmart whose former significant other left when he decided the Marines were his best option after all, but had picked up the car cheap from a couple who liked energetic sex in the back seat and were forced to sell 
when the baby came. The spot of conception marked by a stubborn stain on the fabric, the shape of Texas. And the upshot being a daughter about to complete high school, a couple that had first bought the Ford from a soap salesman, eager for something faster and jazzier, all but the salesman still engaged with the world, at times walking past one another on the street or entering a diner, buying a few roses or riding a bus, a group not quite a family, but who shared a memory of faulty brakes, stuck glove box, interior lights that rarely worked. Seven people, including Ziggy, strangers, intimately linked, except for the soap salesman, the first owner, an erratic driver, dead now 10 years. <laughs> this is called determination. And it starts with, the first word is cabbage, right? It's about a person who was writing his first novel. Determination, cabbage. The first word put down with his new pen, a trophy pen, like a trophy wife, not cheap, absurd to use a ballpoint pen for a task like this, a challenge for which he had also bought a new but antique roll top desk, recently restored with matching chair, also not cheap and for which he'd renovated the attic room with pine paneled walls, bookshelves, and a good light for his new office, or weekend office, a place planned for many years, even before college, back in high school, in fact, a resolve rare in his life, but about which he'd dreamed in free moments at work, and which kept him sane during those tedious years of doing taxes for strangers, but now at last begun, excitingly begun, as he leaned forward with pen raised to put down on paper the first word of his first novel, Cabbage. <laughs> cabbage. I'll read one more of these things. This one is... Uh, I was in Valencia once a number of, quite a few years ago. And uh, it was during this festival in March it's called Las Fias. And there were bullfights during the festival. And my wife and I went to see a bullfight. <coughs> and the, you know, usually did its, its thing, scared the bejesus out of you. And, uh, but when we left, got through the crowd, there was a truck, a great big butcher's truck and the, the six bulls that were, had been killed were all hanging from hooks. And they'd already been skinned. And they were steaming. You know, the steam was just pouring off them from that exertion that they had, their last exertion. And I'd, I'd wanted to write about it for a long time. It took me a long time to find anything about I could do with it. Valencia, and this too goes sort of backward. Droplets of water hang from the rusted ceiling inside the butcher's truck as clouds of steam rise from six slick bodies like prayers ascending to an empty heaven. Six bulls suspended upside down from hooks and stripped of their hides, pink and wet, their black hooves jutting straight out like a lost argument's second thoughts, heads sawn off, severe, severed necks nearly touching, the mix of water and blood, the floor's lake, except this afterlife, the dead flesh still alight from living exertion, vapor surrounded and slashed open from where the pretty killers had thrust, had thrust their sharp points during a 15 minute rush between certain accomplishment and certain defeat, the work begun by a blare of trumpets as the double doors banged open and each creature took its turn shiny, dark, and self-assured, to charge a few steps into the ring, then pause to acknowledge the, the crowd's shout, their great heads erect, the needle tips of their horns pivoting left or right. How strange we must have looked to them, their front legs all but dancing over the freshly swept stand, and eager, surely eager, like someone at the start of life.
Here's a poem I probably read here before. But it's called Turd. The only time I hit a boy in the face surprised us both. He was flailing, I was flailing. We weren't joking around. This was in fifth grade 60 years ago, and I haven't seen him since. Who knows how his life worked out? In those days, being a writer was on the back burner, and being a jet pilot seemed the better choice, perhaps a private detective. Where I was and where I wanted to be were two islands separated by miles of water. I'd stand on my imagined shore and scratch my head. Lots of time passed like that. So I hit him, poked a knuckle in his eye, and everything stopped. I've forgotten what the fight was about. This happened in the boys' dorm at Clear Lake Camp. Rows of bunk beds for 50 kids, and all cheered us on. When I hit his eye, he yelped, he hit me. He wasn't giving credit where credit was due. It was an accident. He was appalled, I was appalled. The boy began to weep, and I began to weep as well. He was nobody I knew. He went to a different school. Boys from my school kept pounding me on the back. Boys from his school led him away, and that was that. But this is just the start of the story. We were there for a fall weekend, and before lunch, the men in charge gathered us together for an announcement. We knew something big was coming. We saw it in their faces, a mixture of moral horror and righteous indignation. This was in 1951, and six of the men were vets. D-Day, Okinawa, they'd seen it all. At first I thought the reason for the meeting was my fight that morning. I was sure the kid had told and I'd be called out. Instead, we heard that some unknown boy had left an oversized turd in the middle of the shower room. Twelve showers, a floor of pink tile, and the turd, six inches long, squatting like a toad in the middle. I know this because the teachers paraded this through single file. The word turd was never used. That's my addition. <laughs> Crap, dump, poop, goblin, black banana, hell's candy, creamy butt nugget, keister cake, lawn sausage, none of this was said. <laughs> the phrase of choice was that an unknown boy had crept into the shower and moved his bowels as he might move an elephant. He had left his BM on the tiles. <laughs> we were children. What we knew about the war was comic book stuff. So the product of one bad boy's moved bowel, viewed through the filter of adult displeasure, seemed equal to Judas's betrayal and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The lecture was long and operatic. Nobody earned, owned up. At last, Mr. Sullivan placed a small desk and chair near the monstrosity, as outside the shower room, 50 boys formed an anxious line. Each was to enter, this is perfectly true, each was to enter, sit down, as Mr. Sullivan, standing above him, shouted, does that belong to you? I won't get mad if you tell me the truth. Despite my innocence, I was sure my guilt would show. I was sure I'd giggle, I was sure I'd weep, I was sure I'd confess to punching a kid in the eye. But why stop with one turd, the mere tip of 10 years of bad behavior? I'd spill out past sins like a fire hose spills out water. I would tell them I stole dollar bills from my mother's purse. I'd tell them I searched my father's coats for coins. I was full of dirty thoughts. I'd killed a robin with a BB gun and buried the body in my little brother's sandbox. I tried on my brother's bra to see, my, I'm sorry, I tried on my mother's bra to see what it looked like. I hid Hershey bars in my room. I didn't believe in God, not one bit. I stole comic books from supermarkets. I didn't return books to the library. I once broke a girl's leg on the teeter-totter and ran away. I spent two hours looking up dictionary, not knowing it started with a W. I was a bad boy, I was born a bad boy, I'd die a bad boy, I was marooned on the island of childhood like a degenerate sailor. 
My only chance, my only chance was to plead guilty and beg for mercy. Mr. Sullivan asked this question. I couldn't look at him. I shook my head. Then came a pause as long as January. Next, he called, and a million birds began to whistle glory. <laughs> Nobody confessed. Buses took us back to East Lansing. For all I know, the turd's still there. <laughs> and shouldn't it be? Shouldn't there be a little turd shrine to bully children and dumb ideas, to pre-adolescent confusion, to always being uncertain and mostly being scared, to all those kids who triple lock the bathroom door and then check the window, afraid of doing something right, of doing something wrong, of getting caught, of getting away, afraid of wearing the wrong colored socks, afraid fl their flies are unzipped, afraid they'll fart in class, a fart like the tuba of John Philip Sousa, <laughs> afraid of pee stains, of reeking armpits, of sudden projectile vomiting. That's the kind of shrine they need, and if that antique turd is gone, I'd be happy to donate one of my own. <laughs> I'm just going to read one more. This is called uh, Laugh. And it's for a friend of mine, a poet by the name of Hayden Carruth who died in 2008. And the he in the first line is Hayden. He was a wonderful poet. Laugh. What he wished was to have his ashes flushed down the ladies' room toilet of Syracuse City Hall. That's where he was living. Syracuse City Hall, which would so clog the pipes that the resulting blast of glutinous broth would douse the place clean much in the way that Heracles once flushed out the Aegean stables. After serious discussion, his wife agreed to do the job. Such an action was in keeping with his anarchist beginnings, letting life come full circle, and being his ultimate say-so on, on the topic of individual liberty. Luckily, or not, he then forgot, and wiser minds prevailed, I don't know and his ashes were packaged up for the obligatory memorial service, probably more than one. So the mayor and his council, all the lackeys, flunkies, toadies, and stoolies, caught up in a spotted cascade down those marble steps and into the astonished street is an event that exists first in my imagination and now in yours. But I'd also have you see him in those last days in, this, in his hospital bed in Utica St. Luke's, wearing the ignominious blue and flower speck nighty, the nurses call a Johnny, stuck with more tubes than a furnace has pipes and contraptions to check every bodily function, including the force of his farts. While his last bit of dignity was just enough to swell that fetid bag, hanging like a golden trophy at the foot of his bed. Blind and half paralyzed, a bloody gauze mitten, to keep his hand from yanking out his pipe, his skin hopscotched with scabs and splotches, his hair and beard like the tossed off cobwebs of a schizophrenic spider. He listened when those of us in the room felt certain he had fallen into his final coma. Listened as his wife read a note from a friend who wrote, how could death matter since his had shuffled off its mortal coil some years before? And he laughed. He burped out a truncated snort, an enfeebled guffaw from fluid-packed lungs. And those of us with him laughed as well. Friends, to none will it come as a surprise to say we're trudging toward the final dark, or that to each of us in life is given a limited allowance of laughs. Save one, save one, to ring death's doorbell and ease your final passage. Thank you. Stephen Dobbins, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Stephen. 
And thanks also to Laura Herskovich, David Leff. For those of you who would like to take Stephen Dobbins home tonight, take a couple of his books instead, which he would be glad to sign for you. The Arts Cafe will return on October 14th with Marilyn Hacker and Nora Fox. The Arts Cafe is a tribute to you, my friends. This is community, and doesn't it feel good? Thank you. Good night.